I want to read from uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. And we're going to begin reading at verse number 4. And I'm going to wait for them to put it up here on the board so I can see it big enough to read it. Amen. We'll go down to verse number 4. Saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Five. For this they willingly are ignorant that they, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Whereby the world that was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Everybody say fire. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. So you better hope that God don't ever say, I'll be there in just a little bit. <laughs> and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I like these verses, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with the great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with the fervent heat. 13. Nevertheless, we according to his promise look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Pray, I feel a preaching spirit here tonight. Amen. I want to talk to you about this fire. Everybody say fire. I, we're not going to sing it, but at home we used to sing this old chorus that said, I wish somebody's soul would catch on fire, burning with the Holy Ghost. Boy, y'all are all getting worried right now, aren't you? Oh, no, it's going to be one of them fire sermons. Amen. God help us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn around somebody next to you and shake their hand and say, catch on fire. Catch on fire. You may be seated. God bless you. Have I got one fanatic in the house here tonight? Just one fanatic. You know what a fanatic is, don't you? Ain't just somebody closer to God than you are. John came preaching a pretty simple message. Repent. Repent. The kingdom of heaven's at hand and God's going to lay the ax to the tree and he's going to cut it down and on he preached. He said, I baptize you unto water, but he that cometh after me unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I. I'm not even worthy to tie or untie his shoes. When he comes, he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with now, last night you got off because I preached about money. It always gets quiet when you preach about money. But tonight it's about fire. Now, I realize that a lot of people take that message and try to preach it, that it's a positive message that John was preaching. And all the word of God is positive in its truest sense. But the fact is, what we would estimate, John's not preaching what we consider to be a positive message. We would call it probably a little negative because he's not preaching about that in the sense that we have often taken it, but actually 
He's talking about judgment. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now, I want to tie in the teachings and the preaching of John to the text at hand tonight. Peter's writing to people because there's a few folks around that got to saying, where is the Lord? You folks been saying that he's coming. Well, where is he at? He hasn't come yet. And so Peter's trying to establish the fact that all the creation has been held by the word of God. I'm going to tell you something tonight that you need to get settled. God cannot lie. I want to say that again because some of you didn't act like you believed it. God cannot lie. Can't lie. I've had people that actually thought God lied to them. And I said, well, if God lied to you, why is the sun still in the sky? You better be glad God cannot lie or that ocean out there would just keep eating away and there wouldn't be nothing left. But the word of God, according to Job, set the boundaries of the sea. And so that's as far as you can go. You can't come any further. The same word of God that did all of that, put the sun in the sky, put everything into orbit, everything about the universe is held, not just by the creative power of the word of God, but the sustaining power of the word of God. Woo, hallelujah. If God lies to you, the universe is in trouble. And I don't think there's anybody in here that big that God's going to lie to you to put the universe out of place. That's going to dawn on some of you what I just said. You really think you're that important that God would lie to you and put everything out of place. Because if God lies one time, it's all a lie. <laughs> and so when he said, I'm coming back, Peter's trying to tell you that a day with God is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. And so you need to quit trying to figure out the time frame because it's beyond you to know. But the fact is that when he said he's coming back, he's coming. Doesn't matter whether he comes back in 15 minutes, 15 years, or 1,500 years, or 15,000 years. The fact is, is he's coming. And I want to serve notice on you tonight. He is coming. I said he's coming. Now, I know we've heard that for a long time, but trust me, you need to just look outside and see what all's going on and understand that the coming of the Lord is pressing upon this end time church. Now, John or Peter wants you to understand some things. Number one, he talks about the creation, the water that was there, and then he talks about another part of water, which was basically what we call Noah's flood. Now, if you understand the writings of Peter, you also know that he talks about that Noah and them was saved by water. I want you to know that Peter is trying to use and show you something that the first time that God judged the earth and took out the earth, the old earth, and brought a new one in was the first time by water, by water. What he's trying to tell you is, is the same God that judged the world and destroyed it by water is holding it in reserve for another impending judgment. The same God that destroyed it by water previously is going to melt it with the fervent heat and he's going to burn it with fire. Praise God. Now, I want to I try to say this where it's, 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 you can understand. The same water that destroyed the world was Noah's salvation. The water came, it took out the old, it destroyed the unrighteousness, it took care of all that but that it also saved Noah. Same water, not a different water, the same water. Somebody said amen. amen. Now, when John preached 
that this one that's coming after me who's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Peter's trying to show you a little something about that fire. Remember, the same water that destroyed the world was Noah's salvation. I believe that the fire of God that fell on the day of Pentecost was the beginning of God's judgment against the world. Praise God. I don't see how you get that. Well, let me help you. Same water that destroyed the world saved Noah. The fire of God, his intention is, as I read to you in the text, is to remove all unrighteousness, is to rid the world of everything that's not like God. So the fact is, is when God filled you with the Holy Ghost, his intention was, is to start his judgment in your life when he baptized you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. The best way I can tell you, and it's going to sound kind of crude, is this. You can burn now or you can burn later. But you're going to burn. I'd just soon let the burning start right now. I'd just soon let the Holy Ghost and fire come into my life and the fire of God to begin to consume everything out of me that's not like God. Oh, here we go. Here we go. So a lot of folks want the Holy Ghost, but they don't want the fire. They like the Holy Ghost. Oh, I like that wonderful sensation called the Holy Ghost. But I don't want the fire of God in my life because the fire of God is going to consume and burn things out of me that's not like God. That's how come I think the best thing that could happen at Turning Point 2012 is for all of us to catch on fire and let the Holy Ghost burn out of us and out of our churches and out of our lives the things that's not like God. Well, I wish somebody would help me here just a second. That's not like God. Woo, hallelujah. I'm going to tell you again, you can burn now or burn later, but you're going to burn. And everything out there that you love, that you think, that you, think you got to have, it's going to be burned with fire. I, know, so I don't believe that, preacher. I, I, we've heard that so long. Well, just remember one thing. Same God that people said, well, he ain't going to destroy it with water. We've never even had anything called rain. No, you've lost your mind. You're crazy. You know what? You're really a crazy preacher. That ain't going to happen. How long have you been preaching that crazy stuff, Noah? The same God that listened to all that mockery and said, you just watch what's about to happen. And when the rain started coming and the flood started coming up, the people began to change their mind. You know what? It's actually going to happen. I got news for you. The fact is that same God that brought the flood is still in control and he's still in charge and he's still a God of righteousness. And this world's getting pretty evil and there's a lot of unrighteousness in it, but you just rest assured, this is not the devil's world in spite of what he makes you think. This is God's world. And God has a plan on how to eradicate it with all unrighteousness. Praise God. But when he gets through with it, he's gonna have a new heaven, he's gonna have a new earth, and righteousness is going to occupy it. Praise God. Praise God. I want to tell you one more time. You can burn now or you can burn later. But everything that's not like God is going to burn. So you might as well find yourself an altar and make up your mind. I choose to be set on fire now. Praise God. Praise God. Woo. Now, let me tell you a little. I, I hesitate to get into this because it's too personal sometimes, but I was pastoring a church, and man, we just could not get a break. I mean, it, we just kept hitting this wall and just kept hitting it, kept hitting it. Man, I haven't told this in so long. 
And so uh, I was preaching out of state and I took one of the men in the church was driving over and I took him. I said, I want you to help me drive a little bit. So we get over, we checked in the room and, and uh, I said, you can just stay here in the room with me. And, and everybody relax. We had two beds. Amen. <laughs> and you <can> stay. <laughs> had to clarify that since I'm from San Francisco. I want you to know that. Amen. <laughs> I'm not confused. Trust me. Amen. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so we got to the room and checked in. I told him, I said, listen, um, I feel like I need to pray. And there's a, there's a nice mall down the highway here and, and there's some restaurants there. And if you want to go down and spend a little time, I understand, but I, I feel like I need to pray. And uh, he said, uh, well, no, Brother Morgan, if, uh, if you're going to pray, I want to stay with you. Well, I, I wouldn't want company in prayer. You know, I don't mind it sometimes, corporate prayer, community prayer, us coming together. But there's other times... It's just you and the good Lord. You know what I'm talking about? And so I said, well, okay. So, well, we went to praying. I'm going to tell you, I did the prayer walk. I did the prayer wheel. I did everything they taught me about prayer. And it wasn't working. It's just like hitting a wall. I was just like, man, this is pitiful. I ain't getting anywhere. So we prayed for a while. I prayed at the end of the bed. I laid across the bed. I propped up beside the bed. I walked through the room. I, I, I thanked God. I rejoiced. I praised. I was just kind of like, okay, God, if you're anywhere near here, it'd be nice for you to let me know. <laughs> Nothing. So we got through, and I sat there for a while, and I just felt that urge. You need to press on a little bit. So I told the guy the second time, I said, there's a nice small shopping center down the road here. There's some really nice restaurants there. If you want to go in there, he said, well, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to stay here and pray a little longer. He said, nope, I'm staying with you. <laughs> mm. So uh, I said, all right. So I went back into prayer. I hadn't started praying two or three minutes. Now, I, I, now listen, I, this is going to be weird for some of you, okay? So just turn to the person next to you and say, he's weird. Let's, get, let's just get it settled. He's weird. <laughs> Talking about myself, not the person next to you. Talking about the preacher. He's weird. <laughs> Strange. All right? Now that we got that settled, I can proceed on now. I've only had this happen to me just three or four times at the most. But there's on occasion this, when God gets ready to show me something, I hear a wind blow. I, it's weird. I don't understand it. It's just kind of like, and brother, the next thing I knew, I heard this wind and it, the best way I can explain it, it was on. Now, the problem was, is when this happened, I was no longer in the room. Here's the weird part. I'm standing. Now, I know it wasn't physical, but just I'm standing, looking down on the earth. I could see it. And out of my peripheral view, Something caught my attention. And when I turned to look, it was a twirling, massive ball of fire. And it was coming toward the earth. And I'm watching it. As it broke into the earth's hemisphere, it splintered. It just like, it just, several balls of fire out of this pool. And I watched it just hit places. But the main one, I watched it, it come over the states, it come over Oklahoma, where I was at, it come over the old community, and I see our church, and then instantly, I'm standing in our sanctuary, about, about somewhere along in here, and I'm watching the pulpit. See, I told you it's weird. And I'm 
watching the pulpit, and this ball of fire comes through the roof, the ceiling, and it hits in front of the pulpit. And when it hit, it explodes, and when it exploded, I heard the Holy Ghost say, the darkness will not prevail against the light. Now listen, out of that ball of fire came thousands of angels. They were bent in forward motion with swords in their hand. Isn't that weird? And so, I mean, well, needless to say, we got a little breakthrough. Let me tell you how it happened. After the vision was over, it was somewhere three, a little after three, and so I picked the phone up because I knew something has happened in our church, in that community. So I picked the phone up, and I'm trying to call, because we had service that night, and I'm trying to call the, one of the assistants that was in charge of the service that night, and I can't get through to him. And I'm getting frustrated because I, I, got, I got to tell somebody. I, you you got to know what's going to happen. And so I finally got through to him just a little bit before 6 o'clock. And when he answered the phone, I said, Steve, he said, oh, my God, Brother Morgan, wait till I tell you what happened to me today. And I said, yeah. Wait till you hear my crazy story. <laughs> and he said, I was down at the church preparing for tonight. He said, I seen some stuff out on the carpet, so I went and got a sweeper, a vacuum sweeper, and I swept it up. And he said, I, I went to put the vacuum sweeper up, the little room over there. And he said, when I did, he said, Brother Morgan, I heard something explode in our sanctuary. And I heard feet running all through the building. He said, there's something, this, this tremendous peace come over me. And I heard a voice say, there's nothing to be afraid of. My angels have now come. He said, isn't that crazy? I said, what time did it happen? He said, a little after three. I said, really? He said, mm-hmm. No, wait till, boy, y'all are looking at me really funny right now. What have you been smoking? <laughs> I think it's all that smoke y'all let out a while ago. I don't know what was in it, but it's kind of. Now, I want you to hear me about something. When, when, we we got to get something straight. We have this opposition, tremendous opposition, but it didn't take God very long to fix it. Oh, I feel a little something starting to raise up and <laughs> I feel a little unbelief here right now. It's all right. God's going to fix it here tonight. So we're going to be good. So I got all excited about this deal. About my God, this fire. And I'm going to tell you something. From that day forward, things changed in that city. So I like to tell you, it changed in the church. It changed there. Now, so a little while later, I had another vision. Same thing, a ball of fire. I was in Colorado preaching at church, sitting in service. Wasn't even thinking about the first one, just sitting there. I mean, it was intense worship. People were magnifying God. They were kind of like people in the front tonight. They was up dancing and shouting in the service and stuff and all. And above all that noise, I heard that crazy wind blow again. And here comes this ball of fire hitting from the pulpit. But this time when it hit, it wasn't angels that came out of it. It was young men. They didn't have swords, they had Bibles. And the Holy Ghost said, I'm going to set churches on fire. And coming out of those churches are going to be flaming evangelists that's going to touch things and ignite things and set things on fire. Amen. Stay with me now, stay with me. And so, I, okay, God, I, another piece of the puzzle. But then... I, 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 but the fire, how do we get the fire? And that's, that's the million dollar question. How do we get this fire? Our God is a consuming fire. The Old Testament's full of examples. The fire in the tabernacle, the fire of God. People got in trouble because they tried to offer a strange fire. Stay with me. So I'm, I'm, I'm in another meeting, and I'm trying to figure this out. I said, okay, God, I just need a little help, a little direction here. How do we get the fire? And you, I'm just a simple person. you got to break everything down real simple for me. And so God said, that's easy. Follow the steps of Elijah. 
I said, what's that? He said, well, number one, you got a nation that's crippled because they can't decide who they want to serve. But I want to answer it by fire. And so Elijah went to the top of the mountain. Now, is, is, this, is this too complicated? He went to the top of the mountain. The first thing he did was, now he gave those false prophets all day. We've already heard it acted out up here. He gave them false prophets all day. And, and before the day was over, Elijah was having fun with them. I mean, he was, he was taunting them. He was making fun of them. He was asking them. And they're out there praying. I mean, they got so desperate, they're cutting themselves. And, and he says, where is your God? Where is your God? And, and I, I, some of the translations, are, it's, it, they're funny. I mean, it's humorous. They, you know, well, I guess your God's on a vacation. One translation says, I guess your God went to the bathroom and he can't hear you. I mean, he gets to mocking them. And I mean, they're, 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 they've gone all day. Now, I want you to listen to me. Do not be deceived by the fact that false religion and false Christianity has had the majority of the day. They've been doing their thing for a while, but the problem is they can't get the fire to fall. Now, they might put on a good show, and they might have a lot of what they call praise or worship up there, but the fact is, there's no fire. There's no fire. The apostolics need to quit sucking our thumbs and feeling sorry for ourselves. God has strategically set this thing up for the end time. And I got news for you. We're right back to where Elijah was. We got a world that's crippled. They don't know which God to serve. We'll just add him to the list. We don't care. But God says, hang on just a second. I'm a consuming fire and I'm also a jealous God. And I'm going to burn and I'm going to send my fire to the earth. Now here we go. Finally, Elijah said, all right, you guys had long enough. The evening sacrifice now, I want to show you the steps. It's simple. The first thing that Elijah did is he rebuilt the altar. Because you cannot have the fire of God separate from the altar. And the reason why there is no fire in a lot of our lives it's because we've taken the altar out of our life because at the altar is where the sacrifice is. And that's why Paul said to the church at Rome, Rome, corrupt Rome, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Because if there's no sacrifice on the altar, there is nothing for the fire to consume. Now, if you want to be set on fire, here's the key to it. You got to build an altar, climb right up on that altar and say, God, let the fire of the Holy Ghost fall right here and let it burn up everything on this altar that's not like you. Help me preach tonight, Holy Ghost. Oh, we want the fire just to fall, but we don't want to build any altars. I got news for you. If it does fall, it's a false fire. They got in trouble because they didn't take the fire off the altar. And the fire of God has always burned close to the altar. Amen. We want old time Pentecost. We want an Azusa Street revival. We want all that stuff to happen. Well, where did it happen? Let me tell you something here tonight. This is not my subject, but I want to tell you. I am convinced, I am convinced that it is the will of God in the next two or three years for there to be a sweeping revelation of the name of Jesus in our world. Are you listening to me? In, in 1913, the revelation of Jesus' name swept from Azusa and Aurora Seco, California, spread up through, the, uh, up through the states, went around, went around the world, the great revelation of the name. They called it the New Light Doctrine. Stay away from that new light stuff. These folks are crazy. It's all about the name. You have to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Next year, the United Pentecostal Church is going to celebrate the 100th centennial, 100 years, the centennial of that revelation. But I am convinced that God doesn't want us just to talk about the past and just celebrate the past. That there is a revelation that needs to sweep our world now. 
Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Let me tell you something. The religious world has accepted a lot of things. They used to laugh at us because we were tongue talkers. Oh, they used to have fun, a bunch of tongue talkers. Now everybody's talking in tongues. Then we, you know, they started toward tongues. The next thing you know, they're accepting the gifts. And then they talk about apostolic restoration. And they want apostolic government. They want apostolic ministry. They're open to five-fold ministry. I mean, brother, they have been after it and after it and after it. And they've embraced a lot of this stuff. And there is only one place left for them to go. Amen. That is the revelation of the mighty God in Christ. And I'll take it a step further. Water baptism in the only saving name there is, which is in the name of Jesus Christ. For neither is there salvation in the other. For there's none of the name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. <coughs> in case you haven't figured it out, you got a one God Jesus name preacher on your hands, and I make no apologies about it. Folks, our world's getting ready for a revelation like it's never seen before. Now listen to me. If it's going to happen, it is contingent upon the people of God praying, praying, praying. We got too many distractions. We're too distracted. That's how come we get more junk in our life. We, we get too busy. We don't have time for the altar. We don't have time to pray. And so the altar gets further away from us. The fire of God's not burning us like it should. And we just keep opening up to more stuff and more junk comes in and more unrighteousness comes in. Does that make sense? Yes. Maybe you don't live in the same world I live in. This is the way it's happening. And then we come to church and we do our little thing and there's unrighteousness even in the congregation and we wonder why is all this stuff going on. I'm going to tell you why it's going on. The altar, 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 the altar. I am shocked at the percentage of our people that don't pray. They want to come and praise, but they don't want to pray. They want to praise a God that they don't pray to. They want to come and feel good like there's some fix somewhere and like there's some kind of a spiritual junkie. Are you listening to me? They want to come and say, Hosanna to the son of David. They want to come and dance a little bit and shorten a little bit. But the fact is they have no altar. And when you get behind all of that, it's nothing but unrighteousness and unclean things and impure things. But if the fire of the Holy Ghost starts burning in us, I got news for you. It'll start burning out of the church. I got some of you, you don't know if you want to get excited about it or not. Why wouldn't you want to get excited about the fire of God burning in your heart? There's something wrong with you if you don't want the fire of God burning in you. That means there's unrighteous things that you love and don't want to get rid of. But it's time to build an altar and it's time to put a sacrifice on it. I wish somebody so would catch on fire here tonight. He rebuilt the altar. And then he said, let's put a sacrifice on it. And they put a sacrifice on it. Now, please listen and don't get nervous. Just, just give me a break. Listen, there is absolutely no such thing as apostolic revival without sacrifice. It does not exist. I have preached in churches. I have preached in places that are having tremendous revival. And those places are churches or whatever you want that are people of sacrifice. They sacrifice. They sacrifice their time. They sacrifice their money. Oh my God, he's back on it again. Some of you are going to get it. I hate to tell you that stuff that you love so much is going to burn. 
You might as well start laying up treasures where it's not. If there's nothing on the altar for it to consume, why do you think it says our God is a consuming fire? See, we say fire, but we take out the word consuming. What is it going to consume if there's nothing on the altar for it to consume? And a lot of us are willing to put a lot of stuff on the altar except our pocketbooks or our billfolds, or better yet, us. Everybody relax. I'm not going to sacrifice. Some of the greatest apostolic services I have ever been in was immediately following a time of sacrifice. Hurricane, um, I remember which one. Isaac just went through New Orleans, but the one before Katrina. We were going to do a crusade in New Orleans before the hurricane, and then the hurricane hit. And so they asked us, instead of doing the crusade, to go in and help the churches build back. And so within probably we were there preaching in one of the churches in New Orleans. I'm going to say within two weeks of the hurricane. Now, you got to remember that a lot of those people out there have just lost everything. Their homes are gone. They don't know if their jobs are coming back. We literally lost entire congregations. There's nothing to come back to. Still nothing to come back to in certain parts of the city. And so I was in there, that church preaching, and a spirit of giving and a spirit of sacrifice come in there. I watched those people in that situation walk up and that night put on the altar $135,000. Brother Parker, the pastor, told me later, he said, Brother Morgan, if that miracle hadn't happened, this church would not have survived. We wouldn't have kept the building. We could not have survived. Well, I've learned something about God. It's a true spirit of sacrifice that comes in. Now, folks, everybody chill. God, God, you know. When true spirit of sacrifice comes in, immediately following, something's going to happen. They come up, they get, now that's not including IOUs. That's not including golf clubs and motorcycles and all the other stuff that people were giving. Now I'm going to help some of you something. A lot of us are just like Ananias and Sapphira. We are pretenders. Let me tell you what got them killed. Those folks in that church was giving everything. They were pouring it out. And Ananias and Sapphira wanted to walk in and pretend that they were giving everything. It wasn't the amount, it was their pretending. Now, don't you listen to me. You are going to stand in judgment with people who gave their life for the gospel. And then we want to come in and act like, oh man, we're giving God everything. It would be better it would have been better for them to say, here you go, Peter, here's 50% of what we sold it for, or here's 30%. Quit lying about it. And we need to do the same thing. We need to quit lying to ourselves and lying to God like, man, we're giving everything. We're not. We're not. Is that too hard for us? We're not. We just need to get honest about it. We're not giving everything to God. Let's just get honest and say, I don't want the peril of pretending. It'll get you in trouble with God. We can't even give a few trinkets or give up a few little things. And those people gave their life. And you're going to stand in judgment in the light of Calvary when Jesus Christ gave everything to save you. My God, every time we give, it ought to be in light of Calvary. Look what he gave. Look what he gave. Does that make sense to anybody? Let the spirit of sacrifice come to our churches. Let us start building some altars again. Let the church of Australia, let the church of Fiji, let these churches start building the altars again. Let us start putting a sacrifice, including ourselves on that altar. Let us believe that God is going to send Holy Ghost and fire into our churches. Woo. Praise God. 
an altar, the sacrifice. And then the strange part, bring me some water. Now remember, they're in a famine because it hasn't rained. And the most precious commodity they got is water. And Elijah said, bring me some barrels of water. What you want it for? Watch. And he just starts dumping it all over the sacrifice and it fills the trenches. He just keeps asking for more and asking for more. And he just keeps pouring on it. Can you imagine what those people thought? My God, man, we're in a famine. It's a drought. And you're pouring precious water on the dirt of this animal over here. You've lost your mind. But the fact is that they've already stated Elijah didn't want to give anybody, especially the enemy, the ability to say, you guys started that fire. In other words, there's nothing humanly impossible to ignite that it's so soaked. <laughs> An altar, a sacrifice, and just get out of the way. 63 word prayer what the false prophets couldn't do for hours how long does it think how long does you think it takes to pray 63 words how long somebody help me out here a couple minutes maybe hmm? 30 words a minute let's say 30 words a minute that's that's two minutes what they couldn't get done in hours <laughs> an old prophet of God in about two minutes. 63 word prayer and all of a sudden the heavens opened <laughs> and this fire came down. It lapped up all the water in the trenches. Whoa. It burned and consumed the sacrifice and the people around it that couldn't quite make up their mind who they wanted to serve began to fall saying, for the Lord, he is God. Amen. Ooh, hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Y'all still want fire in here tonight? Listen, what would happen in these churches that are represented here if we'd go back and start building those altars and putting some sacrifice on it? <sighs> Soaking it with water. I wonder if God could set Australia on fire. I don't know where some of you are at, but you, 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 it's possible. Amen. Yes, it is. And we don't even need the majority. Elijah was not a majority. Just one man said, I think God can do it. And you know what? We don't need everybody in the building believing this tonight. If I could just find a few fanatics in this place, and you know what? I, I think I'm going to catch on fire. I think I'm going to start praying for my church to catch on fire. I'm going to start praying for my nation to catch on fire. Woo! Listen to me. Is it possible? Is this making sense to everybody? Is it possible? Now, this just me thinking tonight that one of those balls of fire that I've seen split off is it possible that one of those was headed for Sydney? Do you really think it's an accident the way this whole service has gone about fire? And I'm standing here preaching to you what I'm preaching to you. I think you might want to just kind of come to out of your spiritual coma and say, you know what? God might actually be talking to us. It just might be the will of God for God to set us on fire. I wonder, now they're here. They, they don't have to be here, but isn't it amazing they're listening to the word of God? So is it possible that God says, you know, I have intent for one of those balls of fire to hit over into Fiji somewhere. I'm not just preaching pie in the sky and trying to hype you up. I'm trying to tell you what I believe is the will of God. I don't think I'm standing here by accident. Not at all. 
I think I'm here by divine providence. I think I'm here in the will of God. I think I'm here to tell you that God wants to set you on fire. You might as well start burning right now. You might as well just get set on fire and burn in the Holy Ghost right now. It needs to burn stuff out of you. I said it ought to burn some stuff out of you. I wish somebody's soul would catch on fire here tonight. I wish somebody would just make up their mind, hey, I think God's trying to talk to me. I can be set on fire. I can do something for God. Let God set this generation on fire. Say that one more time. I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping it up. I really am. That's not a lie. I'm wrapping it up. Now, I want you to listen. If the fire of God falls in this place tonight, it'll start consuming stuff. It will start consuming stuff. I've got a book in my library. It's about, it's about that thick. It's on the life of a guy by the name of John G. Lake, Dr. John G. Lake. Dr. Lake was a physician, but he went to Africa as a missionary in the early 1900s. Well, he was there. He was in a part of their country where there was all kinds of diseases and stuff going through. Just tremendous stories and testimonies about God's protecting him. And they would literally check his blood and stuff, and other people were dying and stuff. And they just, you just have to read the book. Well, his first wife dies while they're in Africa. She literally died from exhaustion. Tremendous miracles. You just, so Dr. Lake comes back to the States, and he settles in, in uh, Spokane, Washington, now, this is in the early 1900s. This is when tuberculosis was killing people and they had the iron lung. Anybody? And so what happened is, is in a five-year period of time in Spokane, Washington, there were 10,000 documented miracles. So much so that the government of the United States declared that Spokane, Washington was the healthiest city in the world because the power of God was there to heal. These are facts. They would come from all over the world in what they called healing rooms. Dr. Lake and his second wife of them, the prayer team, they'd take people in there, they'd pray for them, and if they didn't get healed after a while, they'd take them into another room and pray until God would reveal to them why they weren't getting healed. <laughs> you didn't want to go to the prayer room unless you were serious. <clears throat> Reminds me of when I was a boy in prayer meetings at the little church I grew up in. They used to have what we call the chair. We'd get in prayer meetings, people couldn't break through. They'd bring a chair and put it up here, and they'd have everybody come sit in that chair. And trust me, if you got in the chair, you were going to pray through. Because them old timers would get around you and pray. And pray and pray until you broke through or God spoke to them why you wasn't breaking through. Some of you couldn't handle old time Pentecost. You used this little fluffy stuff. I mean, they, you, you, they pray, they just, you're going to get prayed through. And so this is a little like this healing. Now, I want you to listen to me. Dr. Lake, somebody asked him, you have been mildly used of God. Now, the 10,000 known documented miracles was just in Spokane. It's not including the stuff that he had seen all over the world. And they ask him, how does this happen? What, what takes place? And this is the exact statement. When I lay my hands on them and start praying, it's like I can see their body and I see a dark spot. Wherever that dark spot is, I know that's where the disease is. And he said, then instantly... I see the throne of God, and I see the fire from the throne of God. And I see that fire hurling toward them. And I watch that fire as it enters into their body, and it goes to that dark spot. And I watch the fire of God burn out of them 
the disease and the afflictions. I wish somebody's soul would catch on fire here tonight. I wonder what kind of disease and what kind of fear and what kind of depression and what kind of oppression could be burned out of a lot of people here tonight if the fire of God would just fall in this place. I wonder what kind of stuff that holds you in captivity would have to let you go if it was burned out of your life finally. God, I feel miracles trying to move in this place right now. I wonder what would happen to your ministry if all of a sudden the things that have been binding and resisting it, if the fire of God began to fall and it began to burn out of your spirit and out of your mind, the things that have been resisting. I'm not just saying it. I believe the Holy Ghost can do it. I wonder what would happen here tonight if the fire of God really did fall in this place. I wonder what kind of stuff we'd all be delivered from and God would help us through if the fire of God fell in this place tonight. I want to say it one more time. I wish somebody's soul would catch on fire. I wish somebody would build an altar to God and climb up on that altar and say, here I am, oh God. Let the fire of God consume me and let it burn in me that when I leave here, everything that I touch, it begins to burn with the Holy Ghost. Come on, Australia. It's time to catch on fire. Let God set Australia on fire. Let God set Fiji on fire. Let God set this region on fire. Let the fire of the Holy Ghost begin to burn in our hearts and lives. I wish, I wish, no, I pray somebody's soul catches on fire here tonight. Just one person, just one person, just one person. That's all it takes is one young man, one young lady. That's all it takes is one sir, one ma'am. That's all it takes is for one person in this nation, for one person in this church, for one person in this region to say, it's me, oh God, it's me. Set me on fire and make me a flame. Let me burn with the Holy Ghost. Let me burn now with the Holy Ghost. Come on, I feel something trying to happen in this building right now. Is there anybody here that would cry out to God in desperation, set me on fire? Come on, come on, set me on fire. Set me on fire, God. Let the fire of God burn in me tonight. Let it burn out my fears. Let it burn out my inhibition. Let it burn out these things, oh God. Let it burn. when you get to the altar cry out to him cry out to him cry out to him set me on fire set me on fire <laughs> 